Luke chapter 14 is where we are this morning, and we're continuing this series called Kingdom Math. Kingdom Math, because we want to be a church that is doing God's strategic plan for our lives and for his kingdom. You know, sometimes when you start talking about things like math, it it makes you think of numbers. And there are some people that when you use numbers in regard to what God is doing, they get a little nervous about it. It sounds a little corporate, a little bottom line-ish. And I kind of want to address that as we get started because I want you to understand we are not a church that is about numbers, but we also acknowledge that numbers are important to God. Numbers are not a goal, but they do tell you things. Numbers are not the end, but they allow you to assess and to take measure. And let me make, make sure you understand this. Numbers are important to God. God designed it all. The most important number to God is one because it means complete, it means whole, and it starts with him. And so when you understand that God, I mean, he wrote an entire book of the Bible called Numbers. Right? We know it's important. You remember what happened whenever when Jesus was teaching and he said there were 100 sheep and 99 made it home and one didn't? He noticed. Why? Because numbers are important to God. And when that number is one and that one is you, that matters to you because you are important to God as well. So when we look at this series, we talk about numbers, we talk about strategically dealing with the the, the divine um, methodology that God has put into place to draw people into himself. And we talk about equation, and we talk about math, and we talk about these assignments. Understand we ought not resist those, we embrace those as part of God's plan. So we're going to look, if we could, here at Luke chapter 14. And this is one of my favorite passages of scripture, and it is really cool because it's, it's a little confrontational, and people don't always understand that. But uh, to set up what is going on here, I want you to understand where Jesus is right now. Jesus is having dinner in the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees hated Jesus. He was a threat to everything they stood for. He was an upstart. He was a, to them, he was a charlatan and a fraud who was posing to be deity. And they hated him, and they were afraid of him. And sometimes they were looking for ways to bring him down, to catch him. They needed this guy neutralized. He was a threat to their power structure. He was a threat to all that they stood for and represented and had created in Judaism up to that time. And so you've got this guy claiming to be the son of God. He's got a ragtag band of followers. He's meeting with people that they normally wouldn't have given the time of day to. And what do they do? They say, you know the old saying? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So they said, let's bring him over to dinner. Let's see what makes him tick. Let's trick him up. Let's find out what he's up to. So Jesus goes to dinner at the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees. Now, one of the other things I love about Jesus, and we saw one of the Life University classes is going to be about this, but Jesus was this master storyteller. He could use illustrations. It didn't matter whether it was a parable or something that he said, imagine this, or whether it was looking at an object and saying, look at this fig tree, look at this object, look at this piece of bread, and think about the spiritual truth. Or it was some anecdote that had occurred to him or was occurring around him, but he loved to weave truth through stories. And so as we get into this passage, he's sitting there, and he's sitting with all of these muckety-muck religious people who hated the ground he walked on, and he knew what was at stake there. He knew what was going on. He knew they really didn't want him at their table. He knew that he was being set up. And so he played them like a violin the entire evening. So he's sitting there at the first part of chapter 14. And as he's sitting there and he's eating, there's a crippled guy there, a guy with the dropsy. And we don't know for sure what that meant in those days and what it means in this time. Some people speculate that it's someone who dragged one of his feet as he walked. That was something that was sometimes in the past referred to as dropsy. Perhaps he'd had a stroke or some kind of illness, but, but as he walked, he would kind of drag his, his foot along. But we know that there was some kind of physical infirmity. And so he's looking at him and, and uh, looks around, looks at him, and he goes, so... Think it's a sin to heal on the Sabbath? Oh, now he was playing them. 
And they all looked at him and said, well, yeah, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. What are you going to do? Well, yeah, he's supposed to do good. So they're all supposed to do about themselves. Boom, he heals him. Now they're all shocked. This is work. This is a violation of the law. Somebody contact somebody. What are we going to do? We're sitting here right here. Somebody's got to say something. They're all freaking out. And he goes, so let me ask you guys a question. If you got a donkey or if you got a horse or a cow or something and you're going somewhere and it falls in the ditch on the Sabbath, do you just leave it laying there or do you pull it back out? And they didn't know what to say. So dinner continues a little bit. And he says, hey, 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 let me, let me ask you guys a question. <laughs> when you have these big parties here and, and so forth, do you fight over who gets to sit closest to the boss? Is that what you guys do? Like, like ooh, 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 look at me. I get to sit next to the Sadducees. Or, ooh, look at me. I'm closest to the high priest. And so he puts out this, this next story. He says, you know what I kind of think? He said, I think that maybe it's a good thing to sit at the end of the table, to sit away from the power. And he spins another spiritual truth right there because he was exposing them for being the power-hungry, control-freaked, religious elites that they were who didn't care about the people but cared about their status. Got them again. So then we come to verse 12, and he tells another story. By this time, they got to be listening. Like, what's he up to now, man? For, first of all, he heals a dude on the Sabbath. And the second thing, he really wipes out the seating order real quick. Now, now, what's he up to? So look, if you would, in, verse chap, in, in chapter 14, verse 12. And he said also to the man who had invited him. So this is really great, too. By this time, he's talking to the boss. <laughs> all right? Everybody's around. And so he says, let me just narrow this down really, really specific. All right? Let me just talk to the guy who gave me this invitation to be in this set-up dinner. No, he didn't say it that way. I would have said that, but I'm rude. He was just kind of like putting it out. He said, when you give a dinner or a banquet, how about thinking about this? Do not just invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But how about this? When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread at the kingdom of God. Let me just kind of pause here. And, and, and point out a couple of things that are going on. So he's speaking, and he's speaking in mysterious terms. He's not being confrontational for the purpose of being confrontational. He's not being, you know, that jerk that shows up at your party who's trying to disrupt it. No, he has intentionality to what he's doing, and he's trying to make them uncomfortable enough that they reconsider their ways. And so he said, here's, here, here's a thought, my friend. You've made this lovely banquet. This is a wonderful spread. We all appreciate it. He said, but you know, a lot of times when people give banquets, they give banquets to those who will say, now you come back to mine. I'll give you a nice steak. You give me, you know, a, 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 a big dessert at yours. And, and I'll give you a seat of honor. And then I'll give you a seat at my table that's honored. And, and it's kind of, a, I'll scratch your back, your scratch back. He said, I, I get that. He said, but how about this? Next time you do a banquet, why don't you look for the people who never get invited to banquets? The people who it would be the thrill of their lifetime to sit at a table such as yours who never in their entire lifespan will have the capacity to be able to invite you to a banquet at their house. They may not even have a house. But for those, you inviting them will be a blessing to them. And by the way, let's not make any mistake, God likes that. God likes that. And there's a reward for those who behave in that way for the right reasons. And it went whew, right over one of the guy's heads. Because the first thing the guy says, if you look in verse 15, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said, well, blessed is everyone who will eat bread at the kingdom of God. And you know what he was thinking? He was thinking, that's me, that's me. I'm going to be there. It's so wonderful see, because I'm so righteous and I'm so holy and everyone's going to be there and it's just going to be so good. And, 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 and he immediately put the attention on himself and it wasn't about him. It wasn't about the Sadducee. It was about the people who weren't there. 
And you know, sometimes that's what happens when we get in our spiritual clusters, in our Christian monasteries, in our bubbles of religiosity, we start thinking that, oh, well, it's all about us, and it's all about how much God loves me, and how we serve each other, and, and oh, you're a blessing, I'm a blessing, oh, we're just all blessings, and we're doing all this stuff, to, and we forget that there are still people who've never even got to come to the table. They've never enjoyed the feast. They've never met the master. And yet, here we all are at the table, and man, we're like, pass me another biscuit. <laughs> this is good stuff. And you think this is good stuff. Well, it'll really be good when we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen, brother. Isn't that good preaching? <laughs> but meanwhile, back at the ranch, we've got people out there who would like to have a few crumbs, who are drowning in their pain. They're separated from the feast. And too often, those who are around the table have forgotten that they're those outside the gates. So look in verse 16. But he said to them, let me tell you another story. A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five a yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my banquet. And so Jesus said, I've got another tale to tell you. I've got another story to tell you about who really needs to be at the table and what the table is all about. Let me just kind of pause here and say this. Much of the ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus was spent knocking down the traditions that the Jews had created over the passage of thousands of years that shielded, that, that curtained off God's plan to them. They were no longer able to see it because of their, their arrogance, their systems, their rules, their attitudes, their own ugly sin. They could no longer see the gracious hand of God who had created them and then seen them fall and loved them still and had no less agenda than to be reconciled back to them. They couldn't see it because of all the religious guys who stood with their thumbs in their lapels looking down their noses at the commoners. Couldn't see it anymore. And Jesus said, I want to break down those walls. I want those traditions gone. I want them to see why I'm here, what I'm about to do, and what God has ordained for them to enjoy. And so he knocked down their little petty kingdoms. See, some had notions like you have to be righteous like the Pharisees in order to be right with God. Some said, good Jews don't hang around with bad people. Some thought, well, God is impressed with my good works and my holy actions. Some believed that the law was capable of saving people. They were saying things like, you must keep the Sabbath down to the nth degree in order to be holy. They thought God is a respecter of persons based on wealth or bloodline or title or education or influence. But none of these things were true. And Jesus spent three and a half years dismantling these flawed traditions in word and indeed. But we live in a new era, don't we? Sometimes we call it the age of grace. We call it the church age. This is wonderful. We live in this time. We live in a post-redemptive work of Christ on the cross period of history. 
that moment where the victorious resurrection of our Savior gave us clarity that these people could not yet enjoy. We live in the age of the church of Jesus Christ. We live during a time when we have the, the completed work of God in our hands, multiple copies in our house, bound in rich Corinthian leather if we want it. The words of Jesus highlighted in red. We have that for us right now. And you know what we've done? Just like the Pharisees before us, we've built walls, and we've built traditions, and we've built expectations, and yes, we've built lists. And those things have been barriers between us and those who need Christ. They've become barriers between us and what God commissioned and called and, yes, commanded us to do, which was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It has also created blinders where we no longer see the very opportunities that God has designed for us to join him in to complete his harvest so that he will return. In some ways, we've become just as blind as the guy who said, hey, guess what I'm doing? I'm inviting Jesus to the banquet tonight. This ought to be a hoot. Why don't you come on down? Let's look at the scripture. Let's think of some things perhaps that we have turned into traditions and mentalities. Some of us, while we may not actually say this out loud, we live in such a way that it kind of says we believe it. People should be brought to church in order to hear the gospel. That's the best way to introduce people to Christ. You need to be a pastor or a professional in order to engage people spiritually. Some people have the idea that the Christian mission is to bring about societal change and social justice to the world. Others have said, well, evangelism is best done by proxy and by professionals who have been well-trained and sent by the rest of us. And we should simply give in order to help others go who are actually gifted to call others to the gospel. The church should be a political force in the world. The New Testament church is made of brick and mortar and stone and steel. Now, most of us, when we stop and think about those, might intellectually reject them because we know enough scripture to know that all of those are pretty much false statements. But our behavior is a reflection of what we really believe. And sometimes if you just looked at our behavior, you got to ask the question, what are we doing with the Great Commission? What are we doing with God's directive that we should go into all the world and teach and preach the gospel? So when we think about that, I want you to notice the following about this passage. Number one, we're to engage others with truth without regard for ourselves or whether or not it benefits us. We need to go engage others with truth without regard for ourselves or whether or not there's some kind of benefit in us. Or might I add just to that, or some potential cost to us. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, those guys who saw him in all of these places exercising his mission and his ministry right before their very eyes. He said, guys, for my name's sake, you will suffer. People will gossip and slander you. They will hate you. They will beat you. They will run you out of town. And for most of you, they're going to kill you. And you know what my advice to you is, my good friends, my beloved disciples, my faithful 12, you know what my advice to you is? Get used to it. Take up your cross and follow me. And the cross is going to be heavy, and it's a little embarrassing, and it can be painful, and ultimately it will be the tool for your execution. Remember all of those things because this is what I've called you to do. And we today in this generation, and may I add, I think it's particularly frequently found in the Western church in the United States. 
We have this expectation that our Christianity should cost little and give a lot. That it's all about us, making me comfortable, making me happy. We become consumers. I like this church until this happens, and I'm going to that church until that happens, and then I'm just not going to go to church. I'll just be a member of the internet church. I'll just watch my favorite guru pastor on the internet. I'll look up his YouTubes, and, 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 and I'll do all of those things. And we disconnect from what God has redeemed us to perform until he takes us to heaven. We don't come to church for what's in it for us. You don't worship so that you can enjoy it. You don't come so that it's comfortable for you. You ought to be engaged in the work of the body of Christ because it's what he's called us to do. Save us to perform because there are yet those who need to hear. The time is short. Christ is coming. Sin is real. Hell is hot. And the opportunity is ours. If we'll take it. If we'll take it. We have to rid ourselves of this consumerism that permeates our society, that looks at church like, well, is it Walmart or is it Target? Is it Kohl's or is it, is it some other store? I don't shop there. I shop on the Amazon. So, I mean, it's, 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 it, we have to stop looking at it like that. Well, I just got to tell you, I've got some problems. Well, don't we all? If you have found the church that is perfect, please don't join it. You'll wreck it. It's just not, it just doesn't work that way, folks. It just doesn't work that way. The fact is, we're all broken. We're messed up. We're selfish, and I'm the worst of all of you. I whine. I'm pathetic. I pitch hissy fits all the time. You should be my wife. No, you, I wouldn't wish that on you. Please pray for her. Your pastors aren't perfect. Your elders aren't perfect. Your life university class teachers aren't perfect. The kids teaching your kid life aren't perfect. And neither are you. But you know what we can agree on? God's grace is real. And we all need a big dollop of it every moment of our life. And the best thing you can do with grace is not hoard it. It's share it. It's share it. And in that, ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity Every man, every woman, every child has an opportunity to be grace distributors. Telling others about the wonderful news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, how about throwing a feast for those who won't invite you back to theirs? And so we say, how about sharing the gospel with someone that will not benefit you, that may make you feel a bit uncomfortable, that may be a little risky, that may cause you to sacrifice. How about that? How about looking around you and saying, God, today, who are you going to bring in my life that I should share the testimony of what you have done in my life with them so that they might know that there's hope for them as well? Is it the person who hands you your coffee at Starbucks? Is it the person that you pay for your gasoline to? Is it the guy you wave at at your neighbor? in your neighborhood, who's walking his dog while you're driving to work, and you know every single day he's going to be between this address and that address, walking his dog, and you wave at him every day, but you don't even know his name? Is it the receptionist at your downtown office building who's learned your name, but you don't know hers or his? Is it the person who changes the oil in your car? Is it your favorite waitress down at the local restaurant? Is it your coach of your kid's baseball team? Is it the teacher who's going to greet you at the door this week and hand you a tissue as you drop off your kindergartner? Is it the principal of the school? Is it your teacher in college? Is it your new roommate? Who is that opportunity that God has placed in your life right now for this time and said, here, he's sitting at you at the banquet table. Now's your chance. Now's your chance. How about those Panthers? Who'd you vote for last election? You ever get stuck on I-77? Where'd you go on vacation this year? Oh, we'll talk. We'll talk. But when do we ever say, hey, what do you do on Sundays? What do you think happens to us after we die? Have you ever read the Bible? 
I mean, really read it? Did you grow up in church? Hey, can I tell you, can I tell you something that happened to me a few years ago that has changed my life? And even as I'm kind of shifting the kind of conversations, do you feel a little tension coming up your back? You do, don't you? And you know why? Because Satan doesn't want you to share your faith. He doesn't want you to do it. He wants you to walk away from that opportunity. And so we'll talk about something stupid like politics, something like the Panthers. And I love football. I love politics. I had a cool vacation this summer, and I like talking about it. And I'm going to tell you a dirty little secret. I've been a pastor and in ministry for 34 years. And I get nervous when I talk about my faith to somebody. I do. But that isn't an excuse. I'm going to guess that Jesus, if he knows how we suffer and he's experienced what we've experienced, had to fight through some times when he said, Father, if it be possible, I'd sure like not to have to carry this cup. But he did it because he considered you worth it. And I just want to challenge you. They're worth it, too. They're worth it, too. Here's another thing that we look at. Sometimes the people God wants us to engage are those we're most likely to overlook. Sometimes they're the people that we're most likely to overlook. I'm going to tell you a story, and you'll never, you'll, you'll never think of me as... If you think of me well at all, you'll never think of me well again in the future. This is an embarrassing story. I'm going to be transparent about it because the Lord has used it to, to, in my life in many, many years. But 30 years ago, I was in Albania. Missionary. Missionary. Okay? Go to Albania several times a year. Spent weeks at a time there. Working in orphanages. Just planting a church. Raising money. Helping people. And I'm walking down the streets of Tirana, Albania. Right after communism fell, the poverty was absolutely breathtaking street kids everywhere. I'd see them out my hotel window at night with little bonfires made out of, out of cardboard trying to stay warm. Horrible circumstances. The poverty of communism and socialism created in that country in an atheistic society unlike any the world knew at that time. And I'm serving Jesus. I'm there. Front lines early on. I hear machine guns at night. The revolution was just finishing. I'm walking down the street with my interpreter. We're talking big plans, big plans. And I see this little person darting out of the doorway about a half a block away, some little beggar kid. He'd run out, hold out his hand. People ignore him. He'd go back in, into the doorway. Come back out. Sometimes somebody give him a coin. Most often they just swatted him away. I see him, registers, pay no attention. I'm walking. Well, we're talking about this. We're talking about that. We're talking about this. We're talking about that. I keep walking, walking, walking. And, and I'm deep into all of my conversation. And about that time, boop, out comes this little blob out of nowhere right in front of me. And I literally went, jumped over him. Little kid, no legs, walked on his hands, rags wrapped around one of them, open hand on the other. It was the kid. And I jumped over him, and you know what I did? I kept right on walking. Busy man, got places to go, people to see, things to do. I'm working for Jesus. When all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit nabbed me. And it was as clear a moment, I think, as I've ever had spiritually. When he said, Dan, you just jumped over a crippled kid. You didn't even acknowledge his existence, let alone his need. And I turned to my friend, whose name I still remember, Denise, and I said, come with me. And I stopped and I turned around and we walked back. And that kid was still in the doorway. And for him, it was all about the money. And the kid wanted the money. But at that moment, it wasn't about that kid as much as it was about Dan and his total lack of awareness that God was working around him and he wasn't seeing it. 
And I took some time through the interpreter. I asked him about himself. I talked to him. He had some disabilities. He had some difficulties. I gave him a little bit of money, and I happened to have an Albanian track. And I shared it with him. Now, whether or not he could understand it or whether or not he took it, whether or not, I don't know. I do know this. God on that day, and from that day to this day, has consistently reminded me that my tendency is to jump over people that he's put in my path that I need not overlook. And I need to do something about it. And may I just ask you to consider that sometimes the people God wants us to engage the most are those who are most likely to overlook. Third thing, recognize that not everyone appreciates the honor of God's invitation to receive eternal life. Now, here's how banquets work. They'd send out an invitation. They'd say, I'm going to have a banquet third Thursday of next month. Hold a date. And people put that on their calendar. But they had to kill the cow. They had to cook things. They had to gather the fruit. They had to go to the market. They didn't have deep freezes and and refrigerators. And it would take hours to prep. They wouldn't know the exact time until sometime that day. Then they'd say, okay, I think everything's going to be ready about 5 o'clock. They would send the servants out to the invitees and say, come at 5 o'clock. So they knew the banquet was going to be held, but they didn't know the exact hour until the day of. But they had known the banquet was coming, so they didn't plan anything big on that day. And that's what happened in this hypothetical banquet. And yet when they went out, all of a sudden the excuses came flowing in. And the first guy said, you know, I bought land. I cannot come, but that's bogus because when you bought land in those days, it took days to complete, and it also often involved a feast that that kind of culminated in the transaction because this was historical land. This was not this wasn't running down to a closing office. This was a big deal. He lied. It was a bogus excuse. The other said, "Well, I purchased a herd of oxen, and I got to go try them out and test them." Let me ask you this: Have any of you bought a car recently? You didn't check out first, test drive, have a mechanic look at it, or something? You don't do that. He didn't do it either. It was bogus. It was a lie. They said, I've married a wife. I cannot come. Well, you know what? In those days, weddings took days, sometimes weeks. There were celebrations, parties. People came from all over. It wasn't just a like, well, yeah, we got married yesterday. Didn't see this coming. No, this was something big. Another bogus lie. And you understand that not everybody we invite to the banquet is going to give you a yes. And many times they're going to give you a pathetic excuse, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't invite them doesn't mean we shouldn't invite them. Whether or not they accept the invitation is not the responsibility of the servant. It is between the master and the invitee. Here's the fourth thing. There are those who are ready to receive God's gifts of salvation if we'll just obey his directive to issue the invitation. There are those who would love to receive an invitation. But we got to be the one to give it. That's what God has called us to do. Let me tell you what our goal is. Our goal is that 100% of our church, every man, every woman, every child, will see that it is God's will for their life to be reaching someone, anyone who is far from God, into joining a relationship with him. That is our goal. Every man, every woman, every child, plus an opportunity to share their faith with someone that God brings into their path who is far from God, but you are the roadmap to redemption. Perhaps it's time that we become more concerned with joining people on their journey than judging people in their journey. May I say it again? Perhaps it's time that we become more concerned with joining people on their journey than judging people in their journey. We don't determine whether someone is good enough, bad enough, far enough away, close enough, headed in the right direction, messed up too bad. We don't determine that. All we are to do is to issue the invitation. And sometimes that means inviting them to a meal at your home. Sometimes that's inviting them to engage you in a conversation. Hey, you want to go grab a cup of coffee? Sometimes that's just saying, hey, have you ever read the Bible? I want to read the Bible through this year. Would you? Hey, how about this? At lunch, let's eat a sandwich together, and let's just read like three chapters a day. 
Three chapters a day. Will you read that with me? And maybe we'll discuss it a little bit. Maybe it's a, it's a situation where you invite them to a shared experience. Hey, I go to Planet Fitness every day. I, you know, you want to come with me? I got one of those black card memberships. You can get in free. It's only 10 bucks anyway, but let's go. Come on, let's do it. Let's go exercise. And you begin that relationship and you talk about the Lord as you drive over or you talk about the Lord on your way back. You invite somebody over. God brings into your life regularly. A waitress, a mechanic, of this customer, a neighbor, a colleague, a classmate, a teacher, somebody that you are regularly bumping into. To. Maybe it's something where you want to join in a service. You know, we're going to have a big meal packing thing in September. So excited about it. We're going to pack like 30,000 meals for hungry people. We're going to do it right here in the auditorium. Make sure you watch for that. But here's the thing. You can come and help us pack meals and you don't have to be a member of Life Fellowship Church. It's not going to cost you a dime. So invite your neighbor who doesn't know Jesus and let them see the body of Christ in action and let it be part of their drawing them closer to God. Maybe it's inviting someone to, to respond. You know God's dealing their life. Maybe they've gone through a tragedy. When is the last time you actually asked somebody this? Hey, what are you going to do with Christ's invitation to become part of his family? If I were to show you from the Bible what you can do to have a personal relationship with the one who created you, would you be willing to do what it says if it is something that you could do? Would you like to learn what the scripture says about how we got here and where we're going? When is the last time you gave somebody that pointed of an invitation? Consider these things. God brings people into your path that he wants you to invite to join him. God brings people into your path that he wants you to invite to join him. Who do you know right now that is far from God that he wants you to bring closer to him? I mean, seriously, if every person in this room would write down in their Bible the name of one person that they know who is far from God that he could use to bring them closer to him. He could use you to do that. Can you imagine what could be done in this community for the gospel? Remember, we are not responsible for the response, but we are responsible for delivering the invitation. And it's more than saying, hey, you want to come to church with me? That's the easy way. That's the low-hanging fruit. That's inviting somebody that's easy to the banquet. Now, I'm talking about going out and finding someone that is overlooked. And then here's the great thing. The feast will be held when the last invitee has arrived. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, he said, I send you, I want you to go. And when the gospel has been preached around the world, then I will return. Then the end will come. You say, I want the Lord to come. I want to see Jesus. I look forward to the second coming. The scripture tells us we should pray for the second coming. But the Lord is not going to come until everyone that he wants at the banquet has been invited. We hasten the coming of Christ as we issue the invitations. You say you really want to see Jesus. You really want to see him face to face. The most wonderful thing you can do is invite others to the feast. Every man, every woman, every child. An opportunity <clears throat> is in front of you. I led my first person to Christ when I was nine years old. His name was Ricky Patrick. Little country kid about my age. Actually, he's a year older than me. We became friends. And one day I said, Ricky, I go to church. I know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? And I wasn't good at it. I knew John 3.16 and Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. I quoted verses. And he said, I'll pray. I want to know Jesus. And he prayed and trusted Christ. I took him to my Sunday school teacher later, and he went over it to make sure that he really understood. And five years later, Ricky was swimming in a farm pond in Missouri, not far from where I grew up. And as he was coming out of the pond, he reached up to a fence to grab it, to kind of pull himself out of it, because we country boys, we like to swim in ponds. 
But what he didn't realize, it was a, an electric fence. And as he grabbed the fence, he saw Jesus face to face. And there I was, 15 years old, and it was the first time I'd seen somebody close to me or heard of somebody close to me who died. But you know what the first thing that crossed my mind was? I know where he's at. I know where he's at. Because he came to the banquet. Every man, every woman, every child, plus an opportunity. The banquet awaits.